everybody, welcome back to the Roxy Horror Picture Show. I'm back, I had a little bit of a break. So if you wouldn't mind, at the end of this video, if you do like, please don't forget to click that subscribe button. Today we're going to talk about John Shaw and Jeffrey Evans, I nearly forgot their names. Now these two lads, they escaped England in 1974. The reason why they moved over to Ireland is they were avoiding charges of three rapes that was up against them. One of them happened to be a police officer's daughter, no less. So, yeah, they were going to get a good bit of time for that. When they came over, they landed in Cork and that's where they got caught for robbing a series of houses in a way to survive because they had no jobs, they had nothing. It's all they knew is robbing houses. Now, when they did get caught, they were charged with burglary and they were given a two-year sentence. They only done 18 months of that sentence and when they were released there there were talks about extraditing them back over to England to face them charges but during the 70s as we all know the whole IRA fiasco they they just deemed that there wasn't enough evidence against them so they avoided that check. Now that brings us to August 28th, 1976, County Wicklow. There was a woman there called Elizabeth Plunkett. She was down on holiday from Dublin. She was only 23 years of age. She was down on holiday with her friends and her boyfriend. They were staying at the British Bay Caravan Park. Now, unfortunately, that is where Jeffrey and John were at the time. They were robbing a series of caravans because, like I said before, that's all they knew. That's the way they had they done to survive. They'd rob anything, sell it. That's how they got their money. Now she was at a local pub that was known to the tourists as McDaniel's Pub. She was there with her friends and her boyfriend. But unfortunately she got into a bit of a barney with the boyfriend and she just left. When she left, it was raining quite heavily and she was walking back to the caravan park. But unfortunately, that is where John and Jeff seen her. They were driving by, they put, they drove past her, reversed back, pulled up and says, where are you going? We'll give you a lift. With it heavily raining, she seen no choice or maybe she just didn't want to get wet. And back then it was known to be hitchhiking and around. So she seen no harm in it and she jumped in the car. As soon as she jumped in the car, John was in the back, Jeffrey was at the front. Now, with John in the back of the car, she could feel him looking at her and she began to get a little suspicious. And as she felt like she could escape, they grabbed her and they started beating her. As she was screaming, they stuffed tissue down her throat. And unfortunately, that's where the unmanageable happened. Now, while all this was going on, John, not John, her boyfriend, sorry, started to get a little worried and he left the pub and he went out looking for her. He went back to the caravan, seen she wasn't there, looked all around, asked people, have they seen her? No, nobody seen her. At then, nobody came forward to have seen her. And he even drove back to Dublin, which wasn't that quite, it wasn't really far away, and went to her father's house, asked was she there? She wasn't there. They went back to British Bay. The pair of them looked. All the friends looked, couldn't find her, and that's when they reported. Now, when the report went in, a few days did pass, and everybody obviously started getting worried. And as the police were looking around and asking questions to possible witnesses, two people did come forward and say that they were walking and they seen her jumping into a car with two men. Now, the night in question that she went missing, there was two men seen in the in a wooded area what looked like burning rubbish and a guard did approach them asked them what they were doing they just says we're just burning a bit of rubbish trying to keep ourselves warm he asked their names they gave two false names he gave them a warning to pull it out and they left it like that now a few days passed after that and as they were searching all British Bay all the the police and all the volunteers they went into the local wooded area now, when they were going through the wooded area, they were near enough to where that guard caught the two lads burning supposedly rubbish. I'll get into later what that was. But around that area, they did find a lady's watch and a lady's shoe. And not far from that, they found a pair of size six black steel toe cap shoes 
with brass pins. Now they brought the items to the family and the family did confirm that the watch and the shoe did belong in fact to Elizabeth but they had no idea who the boots were. Now close enough to the boots as well they also found a label with the name Jeff on it. Now when the two lads gave false names they did one of the names was Jeff on it. He didn't say Jeffrey Evans but he did say his first name was Jeff and the guard that found them that night put two and two together and realised that these two there was enough evidence against them to put them up as possible suspects and people of interest to look for. Now while all this was gone obviously there was a bit of a description that was put out in need for people to look out for these two characters. And that brings us to the 10th of September. The lads became aware that they were suspects and they moved to the west of Ireland to avoid the public, I suppose. Now, when they went to the west of Ireland, they were in Clifton where they robbed a car. Now, I can't remember the car. I know it was a Ford. It was a green car anyway. And they hand painted it black. Obviously, that's going to stick out. They didn't think it'd stick out. But if you see a car that's hand painted, not sprayed, not wrapped, you're going to look at it and be like, the state of that yoke. But anyway, that's what they managed to drive around in. And they went to Barna. They bought a cheap caravan and put it in Salt Hill. And that's where they were staying. Now, a few days later, they decided to drive to a small town that was close by called Castle Bear. Now, Castle Bear back then in the 70s was very, very quiet. It was very nice, tight-knit community. There was very little crime. I mean, it was that small and that everybody knew each other. If somebody at one end of the town dropped something, the other end, somebody there would know. It was very, very close-knit. Everybody knew each other and everybody got on. Now, that night in Castle Bar, the two lads were drinking in the pub. I suppose looking for their next victim. I don't know, but they were drinking in the local pub. And they were driving around after that. There, were poor, there was a poor woman there called Mary Duffy. She was quite young herself. She was after working late night in the local cafe. Now, Barry Duffy, Mary Duffy, not Barry, I don't know where that came from. Mary Duffy, sorry, she was well known, well loved, known to be just such a loving, lovely person. She was so nice, so kind to everybody around her. That night she finished late and her brother was meant to be picking her up. Now her brother, he was dropping someone else home. So he was running late. She ran, to, she ran to the local phone box to ring him and he explained the situation. It was there that she was seen by Jeff and by John. They were parked in a car across the way and they noticed her. Instead of waiting, like her brother said, she decided to walk towards the house. I suppose thinking that she might even get there before he even gets to pick her up, thinking um, she might get home quicker. Big mistake. As she was walking off, Jeffrey and John drove by. John jumped out of the back of the car, grabbed her, pulled, put her into the car. As that happened, she did scream. So somebody did witness what happened. They seen, they looked out the window and they just seen, they didn't see it was Mary. They just seen a figure being thrown into a car. Now, as she was thrown into the back of the car, the two lads decided to drive to Clifton. As they were driving to Clifton, the poor girl was raped about four or five times by John. Bet, raped, it was hard. That I couldn't even imagine. That is just, it was very, very, very sad. As they brought her to Clifton, they went into another wooded area. As they went into the wooded area, they pulled her out of the car and they bet her unimaginable and the two of them raped her continuously. Now, obviously, she didn't get home. Her brother didn't find her. And as he went home to see if she was at the house, he noticed that he she wasn't. So they reported her to the local guardie. The next morning, the guards decided to put it out that they were investigating a kidnap or a missing person, sorry. But it did soon turn to kidnap because the person that witnessed that poor girl being thrown into a car came forward and says, 
I seen a person being thrown into a car. I didn't know who it was, but I did see, and they gave a description of a painted black car. Well, they didn't say black because it was quite dark. They did say a car that seemed to have been painted, a bad paint job. They didn't get the reg, but they said it was two men. Now, the guards put two and two together with the fact that Elizabeth only um, barely a month beforehand, similar situation, they did put down that they could be the two men in question that could be behind this also. Now, as they put two and two together and it was, they figured out it could be these two men, they put up another description in the local newspaper. Actually, no, it was all the newspapers and on all the radio channels, they'd say out the description and on the news channels on the TV, they would put up random description of what they could look like. Two days later, the two lads were out again in the back area of Connemara by Mam's Cross. When they were out there, they needed to fill the car with, I think it was petrol. I don't know, but they needed to fill up the car anyway, a few. And they seen two pumps outside a pub. They went and filled the car. Now, the publican did look out. He seen the car. He took down the red. He seen it was badly painted black. So obviously it was a standout car again. I mean, Jesus. They couldn't have made it a bit more. That's the thing that's so crazy. It was so obvious, that car. But anyway, uh, he took down the registration and the description and where they were and he rang the local guards to say that he witnessed, he seen them. The guards looked out for that car around that area and the it wasn't to be seen. They couldn't find the car. Now, Sunday week after that, um, it was the All-Ireland Final, Dublin versus Kerry. Now, over in Ireland for the All-Ireland Final, it's always such a big celebration. Town, every town in Ireland is always packed in the pub. Everybody's in there and they're watching. They're watching it, they're drinking, they're celebrating, they're rooting for their teams. It's, it's a massive event. In Salt Hill, Salt Hill, where the two lads were, Back then, it was such a bustling town. That's where everybody in Galway went to go celebrating. That's where they went on their night nights out. They went to the local um, nightclub, Ocean Wave at the time, or the White Castle. It was such a big, big thing. And obviously, with that, with that day, there was guards all around. They were patrolling to make sure that everybody was keeping their peace. Nobody was getting in trouble. Trying to make it a nice day for everybody else. Now... There was two guards there, Shoxi and Boland, and they were driving around, like I says, to make sure that everybody was keeping peace. And as they were driving through the prom, they noticed that car parked across Ocean Wave. So obviously they were just keeping a lookout. Back then, a lot of people, now people would be like, oh, teenagers, young ones, no. A lot of people, in general, had police scanners, radio scanners, to listen in for the gossip of what was going on, who was in trouble, and all this kind of crack. So, Boland didn't want to radio it in because he didn't want everybody coming making a fuss because it was such a big thing. So, he sent Shoxie down to the local guard station in Galway and he says he'll wait there. So as Shoxi was gone, Boland was parked up around the corner, keeping an eye out at that car. And he seen the two lads come out of Ocean Wave, quite drunk, going towards the car. And he had to make it, make a, t a tough decision, a quick decision. Does he let them jump in the car and follow them? Does he radio it in? Does he ring them? What does he do? So he rang in the station. He went, feck it, no. Going to ring in the station for backup. Sure enough, the guards came out, but before they did, they did get into the car and they did start to drive and Jim followed them, making sure that the guards knew where he was going. And that's when they were caught. They were taken out of the car and they were brought to the local guard station in Salt Hill and then transferred to Eglinton Street, Galway. In Eglinton Street, that is where Geoffrey Shaw was brought down first for interrogation, for questioning. And he was asked about the events that he is basically one of the suspects for Elizabeth's murder in Wicklow. Before they even mentioned Mary, 
that was the one. And he says that the two men of their description was seen in that area at the time and also about the little fire. Now he denied that he was even in the area and he gave this elaborate story where he was and what he was doing. But none of it made sense. And the guard turned around and said, is there anything that you're missing? Are you missing anything out in this story? And he was going on that he was collecting suitcases from Dublin with his clothes in. And he was saying, as a matter of fact, even when I collected my suitcase, I noticed that there was boots missing. And the guard asked him to describe those two, that, well, that pair of boots. And it was the black size six boots. And he goes, we have them. They were in the woods where Elizabeth was, well, we assume Elizabeth was brought. Now let's go to John. John was in the cells and he needed to go to the toilet. This is crazy. He needed to go to the toilet and the guard brought him. They waited outside. John locked the door. He got out the window of the station. So he actually escaped and he was caught walking through town by another guard. Thank God the other guard caught him and brought him in. As soon as he was brought in, he was brought it straight down to the room for questioning. And that's when he admitted everything. He admitted the whole lot. Now, unfortunately, I don't know why, but he wouldn't write down the statement. He asked the guard that was investigating, would he mind if he said, speaks it, the events of what happened, will he write down on statement what he done? Now, as he was stating what happened, the guard can't believe it. it was absolutely that Poor girl Elizabeth, he went into detail. So basically these are the details. Lads, it's not nice. He, they brought her to the woods. And when they brought her to the, in deep into the woods, Jeffrey said to John, would you mind bringing the car down to the car park so it doesn't raise suspicion that it's just parked in the woods, just in case it raises alarm to anybody. And he said, yeah. He was gone for about, four, four and a half hours. As he went down, he got hungry. He wanted a bit of food or whatever before he came back. When he came back, she was tied up. She had her clothes on, but she was tied up. John said that he just went straight to her, ripped off her pants and raped her. Jeffrey apparently walked off a little bit. Once he was finished, Jeffrey came over, raped her. Brutally. After he was done, John raped her again. Once John was finished, Jeffrey turns and says, Right, I'm going to go down, get the car. While I get the car, kill her. No remorse, just kill her. Make sure she's dead. So Jeffrey went to go get the car. He was a little while, and while he was gone for that little while, John raped her over and over, battered her. That poor girl, this was going on for hours. Jeffrey came back and he was like, why didn't you kill her? Remember England, remember England, kill her. So John went and got a shirt out of one of those suitcases. The suitcases part was true, they did go to Dublin to collect suitcases of clothes. But anyway, um, grabbed a shirt out. Obviously when he was pulling out things he must have just left the boots to the side or something. I don't know. But he pulled out a shirt and strangled Elizabeth to death with that shirt. Once they done that they left her in the woods. They went back down to the campsite to rob. To go around robbing again. To grab things to sell off. I don't know. But they went down robbing. They came back five to six hours later and they grabbed her. Now one of the things they did rob out of one of the caravans was a lawnmower. They went to the beach that was close by. They tied her to a lawnmower, put her in a boat and they went out a little bit into the water in the boat and they uh, dropped her in. Now they did strip her down but they dropped her into that water and down she sank. When they came back, they put the they put the boat somewhere else. It wasn't back exactly, but they put they brought the boat in. 
But they grabbed her clothes and they burnt all of her clothes. And that's when the guards seen him. Well, seen the two of them. So that's what they were burning was all evidence. Or they assumed all the evidence. It was absolutely sick. Then he asked about what they'd done to poor Mary. And John admitted they took her from Casabar, they brought her to the woods. They raped and raped and raped the pair of them taking turns. They were beating her black and blue. She was crying. He was explaining how she was constantly crying. She was saying, please, whatever you do, don't kill me. They kept promising they won't. Jeffrey left to, no, John left to go to the caravan drove in, went to the caravan, he grabbed sandwiches, some barley water and a load of tablets. When he got back, Jeffrey was still going at it with her, the poor soul. And they fed her the sandwiches and the water and they gave her the tablets. Now Jeffrey said to her, we're not going to kill you. Eat up, have that water. These are sleeping tablets. When you wake up, you will be back home or where they picked her up. That didn't happen. John went to the car, grabbed a pillow. They had stuff in the back of the car. They grabbed a pillow, threw the pillow on top of her, then decided to take the pillowcase off and strangle her to death. When they done that, they went to a local lake. And when they went to the local lake, they grabbed they went into the little boathouse that was there and they seen that there was breeze blocks there and they tied her to a load of breeze blocks, grabbed the oars of a boat that was there. They went out into the lake and they dumped her body. Now there was a few things, there was like rings and stuff that was on her, they took them off and they just fucked it to the side. John swore everything in that statement, all the Basically everything that he'd done to them, to those two women, he swore to be true. So the guard signed off. But he did add a bit to the statement, the guard. John said afterwards that if they wanted, he would tell them exactly where them bodies are. He did. He brought them first of all to British Bay. He showed them where they done all them horrible things to Elizabeth. They showed them where the boat was and they even showed roughly where her body was. Deep sea diving came out, the guards came out, they sweeped the sea and thank God they found her body. Gave the family a bit of peace. For Mary, he done the exact same, he even showed where the rings were and the rings were there where he threw them. And they went out to the lake and it took, it was over, I think it was two weeks, it took to find that poor woman. Everybody was exhausted by the end of the two weeks. First of all, they were saying, geez, we hope it's not, we hope she's found, but we hope, I don't want to be the one that finds her. Do you know, emotional, can you imagine? Oh, I don't even want to imagine, but what that can do to somebody's psychosis, like what that can do to someone. But they, towards the end, they did admit that even if they find her, just find her and bring her home to her family. And they did, they found her. They identified and they proved it was Mary. Now, when it got out to the public about what happened to, the, to those two girls and what they went through and how brutal their murders were, the whole country was in shock that that even happened. And even though there was a substantial amount of evidence and their confessions, mainly John's, in front of them, it was going to be a long, lengthy court case. And in July 1977, John was up first. Unfortunately, there was a few issues. Because the guards, when they were caught, it was only a few days after Mary's death. So they thought that she, well, Mary's kidnap. They thought Mary could still be alive. So they rushed into looking all around for her body and interrogating them. They never brought them down to the local court. 
So everything that was said in that confession was unlawful. And the guard threw, uh, not the guard, sorry, the judge threw it out. But it was down as a mistrial, thank God, which meant it gave the guards another chance at it at the next trial. The second judge, although he gave out to the guards for the way they handled their arrest and the way they handled the questioning without going through the proper caution, basically he said, you took away those two, this like to John, you took away those two girls' rights of life. We're going to take your right away. And we're going to proceed with this case. Now, I went through the details, everything. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. And he was sentenced to life for kidnap. For basically beating her. For raping her and for her murder. Jeffrey, he was brought up after and it was only the one trial, it didn't need the two trials, thank God. And he basically got the same thing. Now, those two lads, John Shaw is still alive to this day, he's in Castlery Prison. John, uh, Jeffrey, he died back in 19, no, 2012 he went he slipped into a coma and he died of pneumonia in the end of it all he had heart problems but it was pneumonia is what he died of john like i says he's in castlery he's rebuilding computer parts and all this he they never questioned to get out early or for a parole or anything like that they'd never get it anyway those poor girls lads I could never, oh Jesus, I wouldn't even want to imagine that kind of thing happening. But that is the story of Elizabeth Plunkett, Mary Duffy, John Shaw and Geoffrey Evans. Thanks guys for listening and tuning in. I'll be back to you next Friday. I'll definitely be back next Friday. I won't be skipping another week for a while. And I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.